Um, Reed has been invited as the uh, author for this semester's Book of the Semester program by the Kennedy Center, and he's gotten a fair amount of attention with this book, The United States of Europe. Someone told me, Lindy and study abroad told me that someone held it up to Condi Rice in a press conference and said, have you read this book? I'm not exactly sure where that hadn't. happened. What's that? Of course you hadn't. Did this happen? Do you know about this? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, in any event, um, we are talking about T.R. Reed's The United States of Europe. Reed is uh, an accomplished Washington Post writer who, like a lot of writers, spends um, several years in a foreign city and then as a kind of um, farewell project to the city or the country, writes a book about his experience there. And this is a book written based in large part on his experience as a London correspondent for the Washington Post. Reed's now just across the mountains in Denver, so it'll be an easy flight for him. He'll be here on the 30th and speaking at 3 p.m., not in this room, but in the 250 of the Swicket. So I really encourage you to um, uh, tell your students to attend this lecture, and if you are students, to attend the lecture. Uh, I think it'll be quite interesting to have him on campus and to make the arguments on campus that he, some, that he makes in the book. I, I, I've asked three of my colleagues uh, at the, who are active in the Center for the Study of Europe to uh, make some brief comments on the book, and we see this as a way to kind of bring out some of the main themes of the book. We have not, I have to say, carefully coordinated our presentations. So, um, though there is one husband and wife team up there, so maybe they carefully coordinated. You didn't talk about it either. <laughs> You're too busy getting the kids ready for school. And so, uh, who knows what, what uh, chapters out of the whole book we'll cover, but hopefully it'll be enough to whet your appetite. I've asked Jim Faulkner in philosophy to go first. I'm going to follow Jim for a few minutes. Then we'll have Anka Springer from um, French and Italian and Scott Springer from French and Italian um, uh, in the second half of the program. I think we'll each go something like seven or eight minutes, throw out a few themes for discussion. When we do get to the general discussion, I'd like to remind you that since we're recording this, we'll use the one wireless mic, which is over by uh, on our side over there, to pass it around so that you can ask your questions in the microphone. So Jim, will you take it away for us? First, because uh, I'm first in the alphabet, I think that's the way this was decided. Make sure that's turned off. It sounds like. Can you hear me? Is it working? Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I enjoyed reading Reed's book. It reminds me a lot of the books in the 80s and 90s, early 90s, about Japan. Although I think the major difference is that those books were often generated by uh, an implicit racism that I don't find here. Um, but it serves a similar function, and I, I guess I see that function as serving to show Americans uh, a different way of seeing the world than, than the one that they're accustomed to. I think that, for example, I think the brief history of the EU that he gives us is a very helpful thing for Americans. When most Americans think about the EU as something that's come up within the last 10 or 20 years, it's this very newfangled idea. They don't have any idea that this is actually something that's been around, an idea that's been being worked on for a very long time. And I think that for us, that history may be important as a kind of counter history to our own, a way of thinking about what it means today to be a major power in the world. His contrast, for example, of a nation as a center of power and a nation as a, a, nation as a producer of social equity is a really helpful reminder that there is more than one way to think about what it means to be a nation. Now, it remains to be seen, I think, whether the high taxation rates and the high unemployment rates of European countries are going to be able to survive, you know, how will this work out in the long run? But I think in the meantime, it really does serve as a counterexample to a lot of claims that Americans make about how a nation must be run. And it's also, I think, very re relevant to our continued reflection on what it means to have rights. I, <clears throat> I guess on the one hand, uh, I, I question what confidence we should have that the final thinking about human rights was finished with the Constitutional Convention. And on the other hand, uh, I think we ought to be somewhat suspicious that whatever thinking is involved in thinking about human rights requires a 22-page document to spell them out. So we, I think that it, it, it affords us a new way of thinking about them or a time to reflect without necessarily already having been done for us. I think the book explains, in addition, some of the trade and political problems from an EU perspective, and I think many Americans really do need to think about it in those terms because it helps put into perspective the anti-Americanism that sometimes surprises us. I mean, we're, Americans are used to being loved. We want to be liked. 
and it's a kind of surprise to show up in Europe or to read in the magazines and discover that them sometimes we're not liked. What I found interesting, though, is that the, uh, the strength of the, uh, the kinds of claims he makes about anti-Americanism throughout the book are really, in some ways, undercut by his own appendix, where he has this, uh, the read anti-Americanism, uh, what would he call it, index or something like that. Um, his own and, it, and, and he says it's a subjective evaluation. His own subjective evaluation, when he starts dividing it up country by country, doesn't really, I think, support uh, some of the things that he says in the text as a whole. But in the meantime, I think it's useful because he does show how, we've, how we're the ones who created many of the problems that we were concerned about. And in particular, I'm really quite glad to see someone pointing out the strategic blunder uh, of underwriting the development of the EU and a lot of other things by insisting on being the military power in the world. Our insistence that no one else can have military power has cost us financially and made it possible for other people to, uh, to do much better than they would have if, they, if they'd had to have shared. So it's, it's, it's one of those ironies of our uh, insistence on being a power. And his, I think, it's also his discussion of the vote in the UN uh, over the war in Iraq is, is a really helpful reminder that uh, we often think we're dealing with individual states uh, when what we're really dealing with are members of a larger group who see themselves as ha having shared interests and shared uh, uh, goals and objectives. And so that we continue, continuing to think in, in terms of individual states is really deleterious to our foreign policy. We've got to think much more about how these, uh, uh, these people fit together as a, a, as a united Europe rather than simply as France, Germany, Luxembourg, and so on. And I think that can, if we think about the kinds of issues that, that Reed raises for us, that will help us improve the way, the ways that we exist in the world around us. However, I guess my criticisms, uh, and they're not strong criticisms, they're just uh, some problems I have. I think that he underplays the differences between the member states and the EU. Uh, and that's partly, I suppose, because he focuses much more on economics than anything else. And I don't think there's any question that the borderless uh, trade zone has really caught on well, and, and Europeans are justifiably, pr justifiably proud of what's happened there. Um, but only in his second appendix, where he talks about the government bureaucracies of the EU, does he really dis begin to describe some of the messiness that at least we can uh, continue to see and that needs to be worked out if the EU is going to continue to be viable. Now, I actually think the EU is viable, it will survive, <laughs> But I don't think that uh, it, could, it can survive with the, the, the structure that it presently has for a government. I think that's, it's such a messy, strange thing. It's got to change. I think it is changing, but I think that that's one of the challenges that Europeans face. He gives us, and because of the way that he approaches uh, these things, I think he gives us much more the point of view of an intellectual or a bureaucrat. Uh, and there are good reasons for doing so. It's relatively easy to gather that kind of information, read the newspapers, uh, talk to your friends at cocktail parties, whatever. Uh, it's also the gathering of information from people who are influential. But in spite of that, what he overlooks to a, a large degree are the fears that uh, many in smaller nations like uh, the Netherlands, Denmark, uh, Portugal, uh, these reasonable fears they have that this may mean their eventual disappearance into some kind of EU melting pot. Uh, and I think those fears are not just the fears of a crackpot fringe. That these are genuine concerns and things that attention uh, needs to be paid to them in the development of the EU. Uh, I don't know that it means much to us in terms of our relations. I don't think we should uh, try to capitalize on these differences in order to, you know, uh, cause problems or something like that. But I do think that Reed doesn't uh, doesn't talk about them sufficiently, perhaps <coughs> because he doesn't think that that's really relevant to what we're doing. But in the long run, for me, the question is, so what? Right. <clears throat> um, suppose that everything that Reed says about the EU and everything that he says about the US is accurate. What difference would that make? Now, I think there's no question. We need to figure out better how to work with the EU, and, and he, he may help us be more self-aware you know, and enable us to do that. Uh, we need to figure out, especially from my point of view, how not to spin ourselves into a hole by trying to be the, U, uh, the world's policeman. But suppose that in the end, the, the, the EU were to turn out to be economically more powerful than the United States, and indeed even militarily more powerful than the United States. Who cares? Um, what other than envy would make us believe that that's a problem? And I guess it seems to me that a lot of what he's doing here is sort of, and I don't, know what, I don't think it's conscious, but I wonder if a lot of what's going on in this book is a, a, an appeal to our envy. 
Um, consider something that uh, uh, Larry Wimmer in the Econ Department pointed out to me. Brits often complain about the fact that they're no, about what they call the decline of Britain. What they mean by that is they're no longer a world military power. They're no longer a colonial state. But so what? They're financially better off than they are. They're culturally better off than they are. They have a more open society. More people get educated. They have a better health system than they had. I mean, on almost every measurable scale, Britons are better off now than they were under Queen Victoria. So except that they can't claim to be a world power. I guess I feel this pretty much the same way. We could say the same thing about France and other uh, former uh, colonial powers as well. So I guess I want to know why should I worry that the U.S. might become the next Great Britain, a former colonial power, a former superpower. For a brief period in the 20th century, and, and really I think a relatively brief period, we were the superpower. We were not before that. There's every good chance that we will not be in the near future. And I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure if I don't care was meant also meant the end, or <laughs> <laughs> that means the end. Wow. Well, I'm going to focus on something a lot more prosaic than that, um, and that's and that's his uh, chapter in the middle on the welfare state because I, I think that's probably something where uh, the debate between the United States and Europe um, needs to live, and at the same time, uh, it's a, a debate that's often quite confused. And I think that even though, on balance, I, like Jim, found much to like about this book, and I, I think that he sometimes leaves us more confused at the end of the welfare state chapter than we were at the start of it. So though I'm broadly positive about the book, I want to, I think, for purpose of discussion, I'd like to call to your attention some of the, I think, myths about the European welfare state that Reed perpetuates. He didn't invent them because they're out there all the time anyway. But I thought I'd just mention four of them and then end, though, with something more uh, closely aligned with Jim's comment, and I think something quite positive about the book and quite correct about the book, and that has to do with rights. So his basic story is the European welfare state is more generous than the U.S. one, more state-based, and therefore less based on private charity, and then it reflects different values of Europeans versus Americans. Um, and, and again, the chapter, like the book as a whole, is full of these lively anecdotes that are well worth reading. I mean, I wish I could write a book like this, and you know, just sort of tell these stories over and over and over again. It's a lot of fun to read. Um, but, but what are these myths that I mentioned a minute ago? Well, the first one is that the, the European welfare state is what he says, calls relentlessly egalitarian. And that's just wrong. The European welfare state, like our welfare state, is based primarily around insurance principles. And the major idea of an insurance system is that what you get out of it is a function of what you put into it. It's not exactly what you put into it. Hopefully it's grown over time. It's not literally what you put into it because it's generally being funded by some young workers' contributions right now, whereas your contributions when you were a young man or a young woman have long since been spent on somebody else. But in a kind of fiscal sense, what you get out of it is a reflection, a direct reflection of what you put into it. As your income goes up, your contributions go up, and therefore, later on, if you're unemployed, your unemployment benefit goes up, or if you retire, your retirement benefit goes up. Similarly, if you put less into it, you'll get significantly less out of it. So the redistributive power, the relentless egalitarianism of the European welfare system is pretty limited, actually. So I just checked the data again this morning. Um, probably, let me just use one measure, poverty. If you look at the number of people who would be in poverty in their country, and the Europeans measure poverty just a tiny bit differently than Americans do. It's 60 percent, people who le earn less than 60 percent of the average national income. The, the Danes are the most redistributive, and I think the figure was, I've got it written down here somewhere, 29 percent before redistribution, all the way down to 11 percent of the population after redistribution. So that seems pretty substantial, right? Almost one-third of the population would have been below the 60% figure, and after the redistribution happens, it's only 10% of the, only one, one out of 10. So that's a big redistribution effect. But the Danes are quite different on this, and the Scandinavians in particular have, are, are outside the norm. And, and the Italy's at the other end of the scale. They start out with only 21% of the people um, below the poverty line, and after redistribution, it's down to a whopping 
So the point I'm trying to make is not that there's no redistribution, that would be silly, but the idea that it's relentlessly redistributive or relentlessly egalitarian is a significant overstatement. Welfare states in Europe, like here, do soften um, income differentials at the margins, and sometimes a bit more than at the margins, but, but they're not quite so extreme. The second myth is that the European welfare state is different because European values are different. Okay, well, I mean, that's not entirely wrong, but um, really, it, it, what I want to say is it's also a political question because Europeans disagree on all these questions, just like Americans disagree on these questions. When we say we, the Europeans have different values, what we really mean is that the average values or attitudes in country X are different than the average attitudes in the United States, say, or in country Y. And given the range of opinions inside these countries, all of these policies are fought over intensively. And it might surprise you who pushes these policies. And this is really the key point. A lot of Americans think, well, the Europeans have a bigger welfare state because the European left is more powerful politically than the American left is. Well, that's only very partially true. Some of the most important pieces of the European welfare state are actually put in place by the European right. And so in, in the 1940s and 50s, the Swedish employers were having a terrible time losing labor from one sector to another. The Swedish right in concert with the Swedish left, put in place a system of centralized national wage bargaining, which you know they used for the next 40 years, basically, until the 1990s. In the Netherlands, where my ancestors come from, uh, the Christian Democrats were the ones that put in place the shop closing hours. Why? Because they wanted to protect people from having to work on Sunday. Um, in Italy, and France most especially in the 1970s, a whole series of new welfare state measures and labor laws come on the books, put in place not by the left, which is out of power in both countries, but by the right. Why? Because they're concerned about the effects of 1968, the hot autumn in Italy, May and June in, in France. And so the European right has been as politically implicated in, in, in the neutral sense of the term, the construction of the welfare state as has the European left in different ways. But the point is this is not a reflection of different values in any meaningful sense, I think. It's really a, a reflection of different politics in, in, in the deepest sense. The third point that I think is really a myth that comes out of this chapter is that the state dominates European health care. Now, you understand where he gets there because he wrote this book, Living in London, and he starts out with this really nice anecdote about his family needing health care on an emergency basis, and he, they get it done at an NHS clinic, and he's ready to write a big check to somebody, and the punchline is, who do I write the check to? And the answer is, all together now, nobody. Uh, so insurance, but also provides the personnel who deliver the health care. That's actually quite unusual. In most other European countries, health care is provided by private parties. Um, secondly, I would say that my study abroad students in London last semester found it was not actually as uncomplicated as T.R. Reid made it sound. Uh, when they got these hacking coughs that seemed to linger in the chests of study abroad students month after month after month, they finally would go down to one of these clinics and they would find that they would have to pay a fairly hefty fee because they were not in fact covered by the NHS. They used to be, and perhaps they were when Reid was there, they're not anymore. So our students, when they go over there, have to plan, plan on paying uh, something out of pocket. Um, he often says the health care system in Europe is socialized. What he really means by this is there's a system in which there's some kind of universal insurance. But what gets missed in the chapter is that Europeans, like Americans, depend on a combination of public spending and private spending. And Europeans spend a lot of out-of-pocket money, not as much as Americans, but they don't spend as much on health care in general as we do. So they spend a lot of out-of-pocket money on private health care solutions. They'll often top up their public health care insurance with an additional private plan. Or they might even opt out of the public plan and do a private plan entirely in its stead. Again, the welfare state is not so egalitarian when you look at it more closely. In lots and lots of ways, these welfare states depend upon the private provision of services, and in this case, also the private provision of insurance. A quick anecdote, when the, I just finished a book on health care policy in Eastern Europe, and the, when the Czechs went to reform their health insurance system, they said, um, we like the German model of um, provider payment systems, but um, checks will never go for the idea of a copayment. Germans have to pay a copayment. 
And they said, but checks are used to having free health care, so they won't pay a copayment. And so they took the copayment out of the system. And once the copayment was gone, the system quickly went bankrupt. And there were sort of something like 25 of these health insurance funds in the mid 19, early 1990s when they were put in place, and, and rapidly they shrunk down to about three or four. Now, some of that was probably useful and natural attrition, but a lot of it was just that people still thought health care was free. And if you act as if health care is literally free, you'll overuse it. And people in the Czech Republic did overuse it, and they gamed the system, and there were a lot of negative consequences of that. So Europeans for a long, long time have mixed a private and a public provision of health, and it's not, just, it's not socialized medicine. And the, the fourth and last myth that I want to talk about is that European workers and their companies pay small premiums for great health care. They get good health care, but my point is they pay for it. The French health care system was recently voted by the World Health Organization a ranking of a whole bunch of different indicators, the best in the world, and most of the top ten spots are European countries. Uh, so they do have good health care, but it is expensive. They pay a lot for it. Um, and they pay out of pocket for it, and their employers pay for it too. Um, it's not all state spending. So a big issue in Europe is the extent to which the contributions that employers make to these health care plans are a drag on the profits of corporations. And let me point to one, um, one big significant contrast to the United States. Many companies in the United States don't pay into welfare systems at all. And in fact, they use the welfare system as a kind of wage subsidy. And the most impressive and important case here is Walmart. Walmart is 2% of the U.S. gross domestic product. It's a $250 billion company. It's bigger than GM, GE, Ford, and IBM combined. It's not a trivial outfit. It has 1.2 million employees in the U.S. Um, and essentially, your average Walmart clerk makes $8.50 an hour. That translates to about $14,000 a year. In the U.S., the poverty level for a family of three is 15000 a year. So your average full-time Walmart clerk is $1,000 below the poverty level in the United States if they have a spouse and at least one child. Now, what does that mean in terms of public services? Well, uh, a study by the Democratic staff at, at um, one of the House committees um, put together the numbers last year, and they calculated that an average 200-employee Walmart store in the United States costs the federal government about $108,000 each year for the children's health care subsidies, another $125,000 a year in tax credits and deductions for low-income families, and $42,000 more for housing assistance. That makes the total bill for one 200-employee Walmart store $420,000 per year from the federal government coffers. Now, if you have 1.2 million Walmart employees in the United States, that's $2.5 billion in federal spending that goes to subsidize Walmart each year. Now, state costs are also high. California spent $20.3 million on health care costs for Walmart employees in 2003. In the state of Georgia, one out of every four children in their state poverty programs is a child of a Walmart employee. And recently in Arizona, the biggest tax breaks in the history of the state went to the corporation. It's a neat trick. You can be part of the political coalition that denounces government spending and at the same time get those jokers to pick up a big chunk of your wage bill, $2,000 out of every $14,000. So you can't do this in Europe for two reasons. One, most of the country's individual laws say you can't do this. If you want to have low-paid jobs without benefits, they typically have to be part-time, and they have to be very part-time. Uh, and secondly, labor unions are much less subject to the kind of official harassment and outright law-breaking that they face in this country. So there are institutional reasons that the welfare state looks different in different places. I had a, a point I wanted to make about civil rights, but I think I've gone over my seven or eight minutes. I'm going to stop there, and maybe I can sneak it in during the Q&A. So, Anka? Um, my, my topics are smaller and, uh, I would say, more marginal. Uh, I really enjoyed Reed's book. I think it's a gold mine of information on mostly recent European law, economic, social system. I, and I really like the, uh, the way in which he covers such wide topics like, let's say, the transition to the euro um, by discussing it at a European scale and then by examining uh, its impact on simple individuals. 
But I was mostly interested in two aspects. Uh, one is discussed towards the beginning of the book and the other towards the end, so I guess that's why they're marginal. Um, that is the question of national pride and the one of religion in Europe. I have to confess that I recognize myself in Reed's discussion of these aspects. Since, like the Europeans he presents, I am the only one in my neighborhood not to sport an American flag in my front yard, and I'm still surprised to see uh, In God We Trust on American money. Uh, I will begin with uh, the issue of national pride. Reed uh, quotes Jan Bruma, surprised, I guess like myself, at the sight of American flags almost everywhere. And uh, actually, uh, the, the quote uh, talks about uh, this phenomenon as something uh, ridiculous, uh, embarrassing, and so on. Um, and uh, Reed concludes that, and I quote uh, Reed, the place where American patriotism seems to annoy Europeans the most is at uh, in international sporting events. So this national pride in America and the lack of similar overt manifestations uh, in Europe appear as a recent phenomenon, at least post-World War I, if not post-World War II. However, the phenomenon is much older, and it could be put in a historical uh, perspective. Uh, for instance, this is what uh, Alexis de Tocqueville says about national pride in America. So, and he says this uh, in 1832. And I quote, it is impossible to conceive a more troublesome or more garrulous patriotism. It wearies even those who are disposed to respect it. So this, uh, um, this quote is pretty similar to the one given by Reed, and uh, you know, that is pretty recent. And Tocqueville continues, the Americans appear impatient, uh, impatient of the smallest censor and insatiable of praise. Their vanity is not only greedy, but restless and jealous. It will grant nothing while it demands everything, but is ready to beg and quarrel at the same time. And Tocqueville opposes, and that, I think that's interesting, opposes this uh, um, national pride or this uh, patriotism, not to France, but to other European phenomena. And he talks about Europeans and Americans, mainly when he, discuss, when he discusses this uh, aspect. Uh, because what he calls the aristocratic nations uh, are actually European, Western European nations. And Tocqueville explains this um, by a, um, what I could consider a historical point of view. He says, uh, as these privileges, so we're talking about uh, things um, European nations may be proud of or things Americans uh, may be proud of. As these privileges came to them by inheritance, and we're talking about European nations, they regard them in some sort as a portion of themselves or at least as, natural, as a natural right inherent in their own person, persons. These things are not sufficiently new to be made topics of conversation. So to Tocqueville, it's the fact that America had recently acquired certain privileges um, that made them, uh, that made American proud, that makes American uh, patriotic. And he concludes that in democracies, men have almost always recently acquired the advantages which they possess. The consequence is that they feel extreme pleasure in exhibiting them to show others and convince them that they really enjoy them. And actually, uh, Tocqueville quotes some conversations, some like really annoying conversations with Americans who say, uh, well, when complimented about their country, uh, you have a beautiful country. Isn't it the most beautiful country in the world? And uh, um, I think that uh, you know, be, this is a good place to be. Isn't this the best place to be? And so on. So, um, and it is surprising how similar um, these uh, um, assertions are to the ones that Reed uh, uh, mentions as a post 
World War II phenomenon, or as an even, even more recent phenomenon. Um, and the other aspect that was somehow truncated of a historical perspective is religion. Uh, Mr. Reed uh, talks about the irreligiosity irre of European nations, about the scandal aroused by the fact that the European Constitution did not mention the European Christian heritage. However, in a historical context, the disappearance of religious manifestations in European countries, the, uh, as he calls it, the European turning away from the church, is not new. Because once again, Tocqueville talks about similar phenomena in 1832. Um, and he says, Western Europe was the home, mm, actually, well, I'm sorry. Um, it's, it's a quote from uh, um, Reed. Uh, Reed says, Western Europe was the home of the world's biggest religious denomination, the Roman Catholic Church. And the birthplace of most major Protestant faith has turned its back on religion. So Reed talks, you know, seems to be surprised at the fact that the cradle of um, the biggest religious denomination uh, of Catholicism and of uh, uh, Protestant faith uh, is so irreligious uh, um, nowadays. But in 1832, Tocqueville knows that uh, something had happened to this Catholic faith and to this uh, church. Because he says, there is no country in the world where the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than America. So to Tocqueville, old Europe is no longer um, the most um, significant, the most important uh, place for uh, Christian faith. It is America. And uh, this uh, can again, so um, there's another passage where Tocqueville puts together this idea of patriotism um, or national pride and religion. And we understand, that is, you know, it is easy to understand why Tocqueville knows and underlines the fact that Europe is no longer religion-wise what it used to be. And he says, and I quote again from uh, Democracy in America, but epochs sometimes occur in the life of a nation when the old customs of a people are changed, public morality is destroyed, religious belief shaken, and the spell of tradition broken, while the diffusion of knowledge is yet imperfect and the civil rights of the community are ill-secured or confined within narrow limits. The country then assumes a dim and dubious shape in the eyes of the citizens. They no longer behold it in the soil which they inhabit, for that soil is to them an inanimate clod, nor in the usages of their forefathers, which they have learned to regard as a debasing yoke, nor in religion, for of that they doubt, nor in the laws, which do not originate in their own authority, nor in the legislator, whom they fear and despise. The country is lost to their senses they can discover it neither under its own nor under borrowed features. So we have here, I would say, a very clear image of post-revolutionary France. And um, we can see all the um, phenomena that followed you know, um, with uh, the revolution and the empire and the restoration and the impossibility of really restoring, let's say, uh, the Catholic Church in France. So I think that what, uh, or, you know, what, what struck me in these two aspects is the lack of historical perspective. Because such a perspective would have helped us understand, um, would have helped us better understand European attitude towards religion uh, toward pa uh, patriotism, whether we're talking about 19th century Europe or, or post-World uh, War I Europe. And here I think that another distinction that we need to make is a distinction between the official discourse and the unofficial uh, discourse. Because this, this is a very important uh, issue or divide 
that Reed's book doesn't seem to take into account. I'm talking about um, literary discourse or uh, the journalism that represents um, the official um, side of things, uh, let's say during World War I. Um, and because Reed talks about patriotism and national pride during World War I, but doesn't take into account the internationalist avant-garde movement that opposed the official, uh, the official uh, patriotic and pro-war discourse. Um, and, uh, and then second, uh, talking about uh, religion in a historical perspective would lead us to a, I think, more refined view on religion in the former satellites of the Soviet Union, where one can witness phenomena quite different, I would say, from uh, those that we can see in uh, Western European countries. So that's, thank you. Before we go to Scott, I wanted to just uh, mention one more, uh, one more addition to our program. Brooke Durr has joined us from the Marriott School. <laughs> Brooke, are you gonna? You have comments you want to make on the book as well, right? Yeah. Do you join us up here? Sure. Actually, just yeah, okay. Yeah, and then, um, so after Scott goes, then Brooke will do his comments, and then we'll throw it open to the audience. I also think that <clears throat> the United States of Europe is a good book. I actually am teaching a course this semester called The Idea of Europe, and I had my students read the first chapter, which is called The Atlantic Widens. And um, I think it's a useful book, especially because it's a kind of provocation. And it's kind of the flip side of Kagan's book, I think, um, of Paradise and Power. Um, and it seems like he has it in mind in a couple of places when he's writing. Um, I sort of concur with my colleagues, and I'm trying to figure out what I have left to say in my presentation that hasn't already been covered. Um, but um, I, Wade's um, talk resonated, uh, the idea that um, his presentation of uh, the social welfare state is full of myths. I think that's quite clear. If anybody's lived in France, for example, it doesn't quite happen the way he says it does in England. And um, I also think that there's a, there's a um, lack of historical perspective in his, in his rendition of the formation of the European Union. Um, the United States of, of Europe, or the idea of uniting Europe, goes back at least to the Middle Ages, um, but if not the Middle Ages, the 17th century, and he seems to think um, I'm sure he knows this, but he doesn't give any sort of indication of it, um, that it starts um, with the Second World War. Um, and even the name, the United, the United States of Europe, he attribute, attributes it to Winston Churchill, and you can find this name um, quite often in the 19th century, for example. Victor Hugo is famous for using this, Les Etats-Unis d'Europe, for example. So um, I'm sure he knows it, but there are no footnotes and no indications of that. Um, as a literary scholar, I guess I could focus on what makes the book appealing to a wide audience, um, and I think that has to do with his highly readable prose and anecdotes, as, as Wade and uh, Jim have said, and, but also a sort of personalized narrational style. Um, it's quite uncanny how he's present at all these uh, significant events, and it almost seems like a kind of stylistic uh, tick, um, or a, almost like he's writing a novel. Um, <laughs> Um, or even maybe a cinematic style. For example, when he presents, um, he presents his um, story about um, Jack Welch, the former CEO of, of General Electric, and Mario Monti, the head bureaucrat in charge of antitrust law. Uh, he presents in, in, a, in a typical sort of uh, cinematic uh, duel. Um, right? He doesn't really go into details of, of uh, legislation or some sort of technical analysis. It's a, it's a very novelistic or cinematic uh, rendition, I think. Um, but he knows who his audience is. He's, he's appealing to a broad audience, so it makes the book highly readable. But um, I think the book is above all a provocation. Um, behind the smooth and apparently even-handed prose is really a polemical argument. He's definitely on the side of Europe in this story. He thinks Europeans have a better way of life than we do. He thinks that Europe's tendency toward the welfare state is um, the right approach to postmodern governance. He thinks the European anti-war, anti-power approach to geopolitics is the way of the future. Although he does 
defend the American way of life here and there. For example, we're not really like the Lardburgers, if you've read the first chapter, for example. <laughs> we're not really as dumb and boorish as those characters in Jerry Springer, the opera. Um, but the defense, or let's say the even-handedness of the defense of the American way of life seems like a rhetorical strategy more than an authentic defense, to me anyway. I'm reading between the lines here. Uh, I think he thinks that within the caricature of the Lardburgers, that is, for those of you who haven't read it, a family of gun-toting, TV-watching, beer-drinking, and chili cheese dog eating Americans. There is something typically American. We're fat, we're lazy, we're ignorant, we're gun-toting, we're violent, but most of all, we're proud of it. <laughs> he paints a stark and somewhat unnuanced picture of Americans, but primarily because he knows that as a journalist, provocation attracts attention. We're sitting here talking about the book right now. Um, and that it's a way of having a mass audience uh, take a look in the mirror, because there is a certain truth to what he's saying, I think. Um, I think the book's biggest weakness is its lack of a detailed analysis or critique of Europe's problems, problems that may in fact call into question his central thesis, which is that America is on the decline and that Europe is now or at least the next economic and geopolitical superpower to be contended with. China's right up there, but Europe's positioned there now. And some of these critiques have already been covered, so I'll sort of skip to the ones that I think that maybe haven't been. Um, one is that um, in a lot of these arguments, it seems like he equates Europe's um, bureaucratic muscle with the actual power of the European Union. That is, um, the argument about Jack Welch and Mario Monti, for example, uh, which is basically a Euro bureaucratic move, stands in for sort of geopolitical and economic power. Um, that might be the case now. It's not clear that it will be over the long term, especially with some of the problems that, that Jim mentioned. For example, uh, the high labor costs, um, the high price of doing business in, in Europe, um, high unemployment, et cetera. Uh, it's not, it's not clear whether the EU won't have to make more concessions to the marketplace over time. Um, the other, I mentioned Kagan earlier, uh, the other argument that he seems to be making is that, that to be a, a, a powerhouse, a superpower, you don't really need to have a military. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert in this area, but I think the question is still open. He seems to assume that's the case. Um, he talks about, and this actually seems like Kagan's language, he talks about Europe projecting economic power. Kagan talks about their lack of ability to project military power, for example, uh, in the Balkan crisis of the 90s. Um, he talks about Europe's soft power rather than hard power. Um, again, I think these are, these are open questions that will, will be exposed over time. I think one of the biggest issues that he doesn't say word one about is the problem of Islam in modern and contemporary Europe. Um, with eight to 10 percent of the population in France, um, being of Muslim origin, um, in Holland, Belgium, etc. Um, I think it's a, I think it's a big issue that needs to be addressed in um, in a sort of long view or long term view of Europe's future. Uh, another one, which is kind of a, a fuzzy issue, especially for social scientists or political scientists, is the idea of identity, European identity. Uh, what does it mean to feel European? Um, what is European identity? Does it have any substance or is national identity stronger at the end of the day? Um, these are fuzzy issues, but I think they're extremely important ones, especially in times of crisis. To whom or to what political enti entity are you ultimately loyal? This often comes down to a question of identity, which often comes down to a question of feeling. The, the examples he gives that the Europeans are somehow generating a European identity and a European feeling, to me, strike me as quite trivial, actually. Um, one is this idea of Generation E. He has a whole chapter on these young 20-somethings uh, who are in their internet cafes around the various capitals of Europe and who seem to identify with other, others of the same generation in other capitals. But there are lots of 
young uh, Europeans out in the hinterland in provincial cities who don't, don't necessarily have that kind of European connection. Other examples are like Eurovision, uh, this, uh, this concert, right? Somehow that's genera generating this pan-European feeling. Um, doesn't really strike me as that serious of a, of a point or evidence of that. It seems like um, historically what generates that kind of common bond uh, and common identity is um, some sort of conflict, <coughs> maybe a military conflict or some, some form of violence actually. Um, so maybe, maybe Islam will be the issue, who knows. But, um, but I don't think that the examples that he gives actually give any substance to this notion of a European identity. Um, the last little point then, just to save room for um, Brooke, would be his, well, actually, I already covered that, so I'll just stop right there. Thank you. I, I'm sorry. I thought it was at 1.30, and I was uh, eating lunch with the ambassador from Rwanda. So actually, I'm not sorry, because <laughs> mostly conversation was mostly in French, so you can see. Um, I, I wish I were here to have uh, heard these uh, really erudite uh, presentations on uh, book, uh, which essentially was a business book, so that's what I'm <laughs> uh, journalistic, and that's the kind of book you write if you want to generate more consulting, <laughs> so you have a kind of follow-up speech menu or something. Uh, but um, I really agree with the last two speakers. There are parts of it I really liked. I like the fact that it uh, was provocative and got our attention. I'm so sick of uh, working in Europe and kind of coming back, and my colleagues think I've been on vacation, but if you go to Asia, it's a serious business trip. <laughs> <coughs> so, I mean, so in a way, somebody needs to do this kind of stuff, you know, even though it's a little bit kind of overdone. It was way overdone in a way. Um, and I agree, I, I mean, part of me kept wondering whether he had been an expatriate so long he didn't understand the United States anymore. I think that's part of what Scott was saying. I, I was recently uh, at a dinner uh, in Lyon where I was teaching in February in a very bourgeois family, and uh, at dinner were psychiatrists and doctors and intellectuals. and. Um, you know, they pretty much recognize that 40% of the American population, from their point of view, is fairly sophisticated, even though they have trouble with the 52% that elected George Bush. But it's just, not, it's just not so polarized as he's making it sound. And I appreciated Scott's comment. And let me tell you a couple of things as a, a business school professor that I thought were sort of out of it, uh, just since that's the perspective I can talk to. Um, Strategy is about defining your competitive advantage in unique and not easy to imitate ways. And um, so a good strategy for the University of Utah is not to be uh, the opposite of BYU. It's to find something you can do at the University of Utah. And uh, <clears throat> a good strategy for Europe is not to just be the opposite of the United States. Um, so in terms of strategy, the one point that I thought was an interesting one that could really be a global competitive strategic advantage is, in fact, if you can convince the rest of the world that the military option is totally illegitimate and the United States has built up the military option as the last part of its repertoire of pressures, you know, you got something there. You really got sort of a competitive advantage. And the chapter on the uh, European militaries was a little scary. <laughs> so that's an interesting twist. Currency is much more complex than uh, euro dollar. It has to do with debt. You know, it has to do with the uh, Bush decision to not support the, the dollar in the same way that it's been supported. And I mean, it's just a much more, com I hated the chapter called L'Europe qui gagne. Uh, I mean, they own companies, we own companies, the Chinese own companies, the Japanese own companies. 35% of the Airbus is built in the United States. 35% of the Boeings are built in Europe. 
You know, it's just so complex. I, I ran the Johnson & Johnson Advanced uh, Management Program in Switzerland. J&J uh, &J owns lots of European companies. Nobody knows they're J&J &J companies. They, they run the money through Zug. They run it out through Brussels for tax advantages, and it returns home. And the Europeans do the same thing. So, you know, it, that's the global economy. If you take the top six or seven uh, players in any industry, they all pretty much do the same thing, regardless of their country of origin. Uh, they have different cultural differences, very interesting ones, but on a global business point of view. Um, one of the... Uh, one of the parts I dislike uh, about the book in making this sort of Europe-US polarization argument is uh, I think both continents are very worried about Asia. And, and unless you bring in the Chinese military threat and you bring in the sort of uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean business threat, you really don't have the picture it's not like two continents squaring off. I mean, there's a, there's a global thing going on, and China is a very big player. Uh, that sort of looms behind a lot of decisions. And um, so, I mean, those would be just some comments that I would make from a business point of view, and I'll just stop there. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna turn some time over now to the audience to ask any questions you might have. It might get a little bit awkward trying to pass this microphone around, but, but uh, that's what the Kennedy Center would like us to do. So we're going to try to comply. As the uh, European Studies Librarian, I'd like to mention a couple of other books. Kagan was mentioned, which is kind of a, seems to me, Wolfowitzian uh, view. Uh, also, uh, Jeremy Rifkin's European Dream takes things from more of a moral value, social values. Uh, rather than economic point of view. And then uh, John Redwood's Stars and Strife, is anyone uh, familiar with this? The, the subtitle, The Coming Conflicts Between the USA and the European Union. So for those of you interested in kind of taking a different look from a different angle uh, on these, these are some other possibilities. I actually looked at the Rifkin book. It's it's it has this sort of anti-American slant to it as well, showing yeah, Europeans as tone is very uh huh. Except for it's a lot more annoying to read. Uh, <laughs> he has all these sort of little drop-down menus with explanations on things that most people already know about anyway. Um, so if he could have edited that part out, it might have been more interesting to read. My question is actually addressed to uh, you on the end from the business school, um, and also the, well, all of you could probably answer it, but um, I was thinking how Europe and the idea of Europe, the United States of Europe and the United States of America being together corresponds with Victor Hugo's actual client. Well, what, he, what Victor Hugo saw for the future in his essay, L'Avenir, was that there would be a United States of Europe and a United States of America who would be in this idealistic brotherhood. Um, how would something like that uh, work in relation to this this uh, economic and military opponent that might be forming in China and Japan. Uh, just I'll just try, and then my colleagues might have a much more. Uh, you, you, you know, my sense is um, maybe it's best to illustrate it this way: uh, if you're going to build a hard drive, cost you twenty dollars an hour in Europe cost you $16 an hour in the U.S., cost you $12 an hour on the Malaysian Peninsula, and it cost you $7.50 in China to build the exact same product. And so what I encounter amongst uh, CEO types is, you know, that's the war. Where do we do what? Because we build some things in Germany and France because the R&D capacity there is really fantastic. The workhorse are fantastic. We build other things in China, and, and maybe at a more geopolitical level, they're thinking they're American and stuff, but essentially they're thinking like, where is our global strategic advantage? So we don't care where it's produced, unless the State Department tells us we can't produce it there. So maybe that's just a, it's just a very practical thing, but maybe somebody else has a good response to that. 
stand up here because we lost our microphone. But um, I mean, there's so many there's so many issues here about uh, how, if at all, the United States and Europe are going to make some kind of condominium over against Asia. Um, the Europeans, like the United States producers, have looked for the last decade for low cost but geographically close um, producers of subcomponents and in some cases have located the bulk of their manufacturing, even sophisticated manufacturing, in Central and Eastern Europe. So the way we've used Mexico, they've used Hungary. Um, and the question was all along, is that going to be a stable solution? Are the western counties of Hungary, which have a huge amount of foreign direct investment from Austrian and German automobile companies, for example, going to be able to hold that investment? And the Hungarians have been holding their breath, hoping that the answer was yes, because Hungary's economy has been significantly distorted by this development. But on, on, on balance, they're delighted with this investment. And the latest returns suggest that a lot of that, a lot of that will, in fact, go to Asia. Now, that said, um, a lot of it will stay in Hungary as well. And sometimes the same company in Italy, for example, will be able to, uh, say a textile company, will be able to keep a significant amount of high value added textiles in Milan, move some of it outside of, um, outside of Milan to less expensive districts in Poland, say, and then the least value added stuff, say rag production, could go to Romania. And so there's a kind of strategy for keeping as much close to home as you can, but, but acknowledging that some of that's going to bleed off farther and farther. And that's been one of the motives for expanding that European commercial empire to get those East European countries into the Union. It's a big demographic problem that, that Reid doesn't talk about much. And for a lot of people, that in migration from Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic, Romania is going to be the answer to the fact that Europeans have stopped having babies. So. I just wanted to add one really quick PS. I like the GE Honeywell case. Uh, and I, here's what I liked about it. Uh, in the United States, GE is a bellwether company. It's like the trendsetter of management practice. It was the first company in about 95 which made a very kind of European statement. It said nobody's going to get to the top of GE anymore without having at least two international assignments. And when um, the EU turned down GE, everybody took notice. And so that is a good thing from my point of view. Otherwise, Europe's the farm club. Just the same, you know, so Reid overstates it. But on the other hand, that was a really important moment. Now you have CEOs saying, hmm, maybe we have to sort of check on our world market, you know, if we're going to do something. It's, uh, it's been a very productive hour. I've appreciated all this. But I, I kind of want to go back to Jim's I don't care, so what, big deal. <laughs> the big deal, Jim, is the Bush administration. And um, I'm interested in your thoughts about how different constructions of Europe of the rest of the world play for the majority of Americans. I mean, we all know it's more complicated than, but um, uh, President Bush was reelected on the stay the course. I mean, the, the most simplistic kind of, of thinking. Uh, my question to the panel is, is how we can unlard the lard burgers. I mean, what, you know, it's all well for a group of scholars to sit around and critique the book and look at things. But uh, I appreciate it because it's provocative and it, 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 it directly challenges, I think, I would, I would venture to say the majority of Americans construction of Europe uh, or, or, or any other non-American uh, entity. I mean, how, how do we address that? I, I don't have any, um, I don't have any real answers to what you have to say. I'm after all a philosopher, not a... <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you don't care. <laughs> Well, no, it's not that I don't, I care about a lot of things, but I don't care whether we're first or second. That's what I don't care about. I mean, it doesn't matter to me. Or third or fourth. As long as we're I think there, it I matters to Americans, and I think they're, they're politicians on the right who can make it matter. That's right. Um, but, but I guess it seems to me that in the long, I mean, here's uh, the practical side of me, which is, there's not much of me over there, but 
um, the practical side of me tends to believe that in the long run, uh, what will really matter is economics. Right? And, and that the economic reality is the kinds of things that we see in the GE Honeywell examples and not the kinds of things you see in a political campaign, which four years, three years from now, will be completely different. Um, I actually think that we pay too much attention to some of that and that what will really dictate what happens is what happens economically between us. Now, I think there's more, there ought to be more than that, but I think that at the base, it's really an economic question, more than, much more than it's a political question. The political questions will get driven by those economic questions. I mean, I'll say one word about that because I think I think the substance of the, the the implicit part of the question is right. I mean that um, lots and lots of Americans care a great deal about the idea that we're number one and we need to stay there. There was a book, one of, one of these books that came out in the 80s was called Japan is Number One, right? right? It's a really, really interesting book talking about how Japan could be number one and what that would mean psychologically for Americans if that were the case. I, I, so I agree with the premise of your question. What I observe a lot are two framings of the way Europeans are that are probably not very helpful for Americans, as Brooks says, trying to understand what's going on over in Europe. One is that they're secular and the other is that they're all peaceniks. And I think it's really important for American audiences, especially political moderates and independents who don't exist in Utah but do exist in other states. <laughs> I mean, it's absolutely, no, it's absolutely true. I mean, Republican voters self-identify as conservatives in Utah. Democratic voters, to the extent there are some in Utah, 20 percent, self-identify as liberals. There, there's no middle in Utah. But there are moderates around the country. And the, one of the arguments you can make on security is that the Europeans have done a number of very, very difficult things for them in the last 15 years. They fought a war in Kosovo without a UN resolution because the Soviets would have, the Russians would have vetoed it. Uh, Germany changed its constitution in order to allow out of area operations. Uh, the German government survived the no confidence vote by a couple of votes in order to send soldiers to ISAF. Um, the Europeans have more peacekeeping troops out there than the Americans do. It's not a trivial contribution. Go on to something like the Heritage Foundation website and you'll see them openly acknowledging that the Europeans are a really important partner. And, and even the far right, I would say, understands this. Their issue is how can we get them to cooperate with us and what we know is the right thing to do. Now that's a separate issue, but for Americans I think a, pr a preliminary step would be to recognize how much the Europeans have done over the last 15 years to make a contribution to a stable order in, in the world and, they ha and, and that's in full acknowledgement of their mistakes in Srebrenica, their, in Rwanda, which they share with us. I mean, there have been a lot of very, very serious problems. I don't want to diminish those at all, but Americans need to get that message. And the secular one, I think, here is particularly uh, difficult. I mean, uh, Americans do see Europeans as almost entirely secular, and it's just, it's just, I think, empirically not so. Europeans care about religion in a great variety of ways. They don't express it in the same way that Americans do, but then virtually no one else expresses it the way that Americans do, and I think we should be a little more open to acknowledging the way that religion is meaningful within Europe and continues to be meaningful within Europe and not simply write them off as a kind of secular people that are afraid of everybody else and presumably now devoted just to making money. It sounds like a character to me. I was going to make a comment with the religion situation. The United States never had a religion imposed into the people every day's life. And uh, at least the Catholic um, countries, even France, Spain, Italy, and Portugal have been, it's, it's, it was a forced religion by the governments. But now, I know that, <clears throat> especially in Spain, after what that happened, they're coming back to the religion, but with more open-minded way of thinking, and they're looking a little bit more into compassion, being generous with their neighbors. They're looking more into 
interaction with other people in helping each other than the religion per se. And in France is very similar to, they have been scared of religions. I don't know about England or, or Germany, but uh, that's the case in the, at least Southern European countries. They had a total do economic domi domination. I don't know. If, oh, yeah, this is working. Uh, you know, um, I find the people, uh, I teach at the UM Lyon uh, Business School about three or four times a year, I find the very principled, I think very Christian in their values, very concerned about a lot of great issues that we're not concerned enough about, and very willing to talk uh, about religion privately, but not publicly. And Yvonne probably knows a lot better than I do, but you know, uh, the mission president in uh, the Swiss Geneva mission, which is where the Lyon is, is so happy that I'm bringing 15 BYU students to OM Lyon in uh, April. Um, and their particular mission is to just be normal people, not dressed in black, not with three wives, not, not weird, just be good students. You know, uh, so that, and just be normally inquisitive because really there's a huge public affairs thing and they think that uh, one of the things going on right now is do, we, do Mormons treat their women the same as Muslims do? So that's one of the big questions going on in the sect uh, committee. So I mean, you know, just all these misperceptions and uh, you can just see, I think, and you re referred to this. I mean, it's just like missing each other but actually, if you can get down to talking about it, I mean, people are people and they respect you. No, I just wanted to come back to Phil's question for a second, how to, how to get the message out. And um, after Wade's comment, I was thinking, Reed's book actually perpetuates that myth as well, that, um, that Europe is um, more peace-loving than the Americans and that you can get away without um, having a real military. Uh, he seems to buy into that idea, and um, and so if this is going to be a um, you know a book that's bought by a lot of people, sort of general Americans to whom you want to get your message out to, uh, I don't think this particular book is going to help that much on that on that particular issue. Um, 